Well, today we'll see uh, Mole Flanders by Daniel Defer. We know already that uh, Daniel Defer was one of the first ones to write in the new genre called the novel. Among his works, we should remember Robinson Crusoe, 1719, and Mole Flanders, that we're going to see today. If we have a look at uh, the index, what happens in the story? Well, a childhood, marriage, another affair, another husband, uh, another husband, uh, she becomes a criminal, she goes to the prison of Newgate, and finally they go to America, and this is the end, uh, a positive, happy ending. She begins her life uh, at a disadvantage, because being the daughter of uh, a convict, that is a prisoner who was sent to work in a colony, she had no family. For a woman, it was not that easy to find a job. So she became a, a maid, then uh, she tried to find her husband, more than one, uh, but uh, when she was uh, 48, uh, she was too old to hope to find uh, another husband. And then something happened to her and she began to steal things. At the end she's uh, arrested, uh, imprisoned, and then at the end there's a positive ending because she becomes uh, rich and uh, can go back to England and uh, start a new life. This story is uh, told in the first person, like Robinson Crusoe, and uh, this is very interesting. Uh, you know, in Puritan England, uh, if you wrote a story about you know scandals, um, uh, different uh, affairs, crimes, you were compelled to convey a, a moral lesson. But uh, in a way, Defoe, when uh, through the protagonist. Uh, tries to excuse her act, explain them as a, a material necessity, because uh, some of her problems are connected to the social conditions of women uh, in those years. Let's uh, listen to the first part. In this distress I had no assistant, no friend to comfort or advise me. I sat and cried and tormented myself night and day, wringing my hands, and sometimes raving like a distracted woman. And indeed, I have often wondered it had not affected my reason, for I had the vapours to such a degree that my understanding was sometimes quite lost in fancies and imaginations. I lived two years in this dismal condition, wasting that little I had, weeping continually over my dismal circumstances, and, as it were, only bleeding to death, without the least hope or prospect of help from God or man. And now I had cried too long, and so often, the tears were, as I might say, exhausted. And I began to be desperate, for I grew poor apace. For a little relief, I had put off my house and took lodgings, and I was reducing my living, so I sold off most of my goods, which put a little money in my pocket, and I lived near a year upon that, spending very sparingly, and eking things out to the utmost. But still, when I looked before me, my very heart would sink within me at the inevitable approach of misery and want. Oh, let none read this part without seriously reflecting on the circumstances of a desolate state, and how they would grapple with mere want of friends and want of bread. It will certainly make them think not of sparing what they have only, but of looking up to heaven for support. And of the wise man's prayer, Give me not poverty, lest I steal. As you can see here, initially, before she becomes a criminal, she found herself in a similar condition to the one of Robinson Crusoe. 
she was left alone in London, not on a desert island, but in London, without friends, without anybody to help her. And she was uh, really miserable. There was nothing but distress, extreme poverty. Her mental stability began to be uncertain because of uh, concerns for her survival. So, in the same way as Robinson Crusoe had to find ways to survive because he was alone with just a few things uh, with him, uh, in the same way, more Flanders, even if she's in London, has to survive, find a way to survive. And she was a distracted woman, raving like a mad person, and there was nobody to assist her, no friend to advise. And uh, here, if you remember Robinson Crusoe, Robinson Crusoe was uh, always oscillating, was always between one extreme and the other. Uh, when he used the imagination, when he was prey to his uh, fantasies, to his fears, he was in distress, miserable. But when he used the reason, he tried to rationalize, he felt instead optimistic. Uh, and so here, the reason why Molly is uh, so distracted, so in distress, is because she finds herself lost in uh, fancies and imagination. How can you survive without anything? For two years, she managed. She had uh, a few things left from her previous life, and she sold everything, jewels, clothes, uh, she left her house uh, in order to buy something to eat and pay the rent for a room. And nobody could help her, not even God. And then at the end, uh, she says, God, give me no poverty, lest I still. If uh, I become poor without any means of survival, then I will be tempted to steal because I need to survive. Let them remember that a time of distress is a time of dreadful temptation, and all the strength to resist is taken away. Poverty presses. The soul is made desperate by distress, and what can be done? It was one evening when being brought, as I may say, to the last gasp. I think I may truly say I was distracted and raving. When prompted by I know not what spirit, and, as it were, doing I did not know what or why. I dressed me, for I had still pretty good clothes, and went out. I am very sure I had no manner of design in my head when I went out. I neither knew nor considered where to go or on what business. But as the devil carried me out, and laid his bait for me, so he brought me, to be sure, to the place, for I knew not whither I was going or what I did. Wandering thus about, I knew not whither. I passed by an apothecary shop in Leadenhall Street, when I saw lie on a stool just before the counter, a little bundle wrapped in a white cloth. Beyond it stood a maidservant with her back to it, looking towards the top of the shop, where the apothecary's apprentice, as I suppose, was standing upon the counter, with his back also to the door, and a candle in his hand, looking and reaching up to the upper shelf for something he wanted, so that both were engaged mighty earnestly and nobody else in the shop. And in this condition of distress and temptation, it was one evening, and here there is a, a precise description of what happened one day in her life. And uh, when she describes uh, the event of that evening, on the one hand, she will continue to say, that she was confused, she did not know what she was doing. So she didn't know why, but uh, she dressed herself and noticed here, uh, for I had still pretty good clothes. So she's, you know, even if she's in distress, she has uh, 
you can uh, appreciate you know, how she looks, her clothes, her condition, her previous condition, and went out. Also here, she says, I had no plan in my head when I went out. I was wandering, I was walking here and there, when I found myself in front of a shop in a, in a street of London, and uh, what was inside the shop? There was a stool, say a chair, uh, and on top of this chair there was uh, a bundle, you know, something, a package. Inside the shop, it was not uh, particularly lit, uh, there was um, a customer, a maid servant, a young lady, with the back to the door, and there was an assistant, a shop assistant, who was standing on top of the counter uh, trying to find the things that uh, the girl wanted. So the two people inside the shop were not looking at her. And so, what did she do? This was the bait. And the devil, who I said laid the snare as readily prompted me as if he had spoke. For I remember, and shall never forget it. T'was like a voice spoken to me over my shoulder. Take the bundle, be quick, do it this moment. It was no sooner said, but I stepped into the shop, and with my back to the wench, as if I had stood up for a cart that was going by, I put my hand behind me, and took the bundle, and went off with it. The maid or the fellow not perceiving me, or any one else. It is impossible to express the horror of my soul all the while I did it. When I went away, I had no heart to run, or scarce to mend my pace. I crossed the street, indeed, and went down the first turning I came to. And I think it was a street that went through into Fenchurch Street. From thence I crossed and turned through so many ways and turnings that I could never tell which way it was, not where I went, for I felt not the ground I stepped on. And the farther I was out of danger, the faster I went till, tired and out of breath, I was forced to sit down on a little bench at a door, and then I began to recover and found I was got into Thames Street, near Billingsgate. I rested me a little and went on. My blood was all in a fire. My heart beat as if I was in a sudden fright. In short, I was under such a surprise that I still knew not whither I was going, or what to do. That was the bait. And she says, the devil. She heard a voice on her shoulder. And the voice said, take the bundle, be quick, do it this moment. And so she followed this voice, and she went inside, silently, took the bundle, and left. Nobody had noticed her. She took the bundle, and now the first reaction is horror. Why did I do that? But uh, even with this feeling of horror, uh, she went away, and went, uh, you know, far away from the shop, noticed the names of the streets, real streets in London, and she walked until she found uh, she was in Thames Street, and then she was so exhausted emotionally and physically that uh, she rested a little, and uh, here is, she insists, I did not know what I was going to do or what to do. So, on the one hand, uh, she follows the voice inside the soft and to take a bundle, and then she runs away, and she doesn't know what to do. After I had tired myself thus, with walking a long way about, and so eagerly, I began to consider and make home to my lodging, where I came about nine o'clock at night, when the bundle was made up for, or on what occasion laid where I found it, I knew not. But when I came to open it, I found there was a suit of childbed linen in it. Very good and almost new. The lace very fine. There was a silver porringer of a pint. A small silver mug and six spoons, with some other linen. A good smock. And three silk handkerchiefs. And in the mug, wrapped up in a paper, eight. Eighteen shillings, six pence in money, 
All the while I was opening these things, I was under such dreadful impressions of fear, and I such terror of mind, though I was perfectly safe, that I cannot express the manner of it. I sat me down, and cried most vehemently. Lord, said I, what am I now? A thief? Why, I shall be taken next time, and be carried to Newgate, and be tried for my life. And with that I cried again a long time, and I am sure, as poor as I was, if I had durst for fear, I would certainly have carried the things back again. But that went off after a while. Later, around uh, nine o'clock, precise time, she went back home. And now there is a, a precise inventory, a list of all the things that were inside the bundle. Apparently, for us today, they were, you know, just things, not precious things, but those items were quite expensive in, in those days. In particular, there was money and there were uh, silk handkerchiefs and some uh, silver objects. And now, with those objects in front of her, she starts asking herself, Lord, what am I now? A thief? Oh, if they find me, they will carry me to Newgate, to the prison of Newgate. And so she cried, she felt, you know, miserable, and that uh, crisis lasted for some time. She went to bed, she tried to sleep, but slept very little. And, and this miserable condition lasted for three or four days. But uh, the reality that she had nothing to eat made her more pragmatic. On the one hand, she asked God, she prayed to God to be guided to do what was uh, the proper thing to do. She went to bed, but she couldn't sleep. And now she had to decide what to do. Now, uh, there were two possibilities. One, to take the bundle back to the shop. Why? First, because she had stolen it, and second, because maybe the young woman who was at the shop uh, was uh, in a similar situation, in a poor condition, was uh, herself a poor person, and she really needed those objects. They were the only things she had, and so now, having taken that bundle, that action had made the young woman poor, in a condition similar to the one where Molly finds herself. But this choice was uh, abandoned because of survival. When you are starving, you have nothing to eat. Then, before thinking of others, you think of yourself. And so for self-preservation, to, to be able to continue her life, she kept the objects. In this way, she could continue to live, survive for some more time. But after some time, this uh, voice came back. And this voice forced her to steal again. And this was the beginning of her career as a criminal. Let's uh, summarize uh, what we've been talking about. First of all, Montflamme is a story, a tale, of a woman whose morals, whose morality is questionable, is not uh, one to imitate. Three things characterize her life. First, romantic affairs, husbands. The use of her, you know, her body also to better her social condition, to find stability, economic stability. At a certain point in her life, to survive, she had to steal. She became a criminal. But at the end of her life, she found redemption. She reconciled herself. She, she met again one of her husbands, and uh, with him, he finds redemption. She becomes rich. She can go back to England and live a happy life. What are some of the themes we can find in this story? First of all, absolute pragmatism. When you don't have a choice, you need to survive. You do what is necessary to you here and now. You don't think about society, but about the other. This character is a bit ambiguous, as you have probably seen. On the one hand, you know, she wants to pray God, she was she's sorry for what she has done on the other she continues her criminal life at the end there's punishment because she's arrested she goes to prison and redemption so in a way there's a happy ending and we, from here we can find also a moral message 
here are now some questions we should uh, consider if you want to really understand the novel. Do you think that uh, in this century there was a tendency, every situation was reduced to its materialistic basis, to only survival and uh, social status, or could you find in the story something different, something else? Molly became a criminal, but who or what is responsible for her destiny, for her choice in life? Is she responsible for her actions, or is society responsible for what Molly did? Another thing is the moral message at the end of uh, this story. In your opinion, what kind of message could we see, could the story convey to us? The story is in the first person. As you know, when somebody tells a story in the first person, we feel sort of empathy towards this person, this character. Now, you know, and also when uh, Molly describes how she was miserable, tempted, uh, this uh, conflict inside herself, do you think that because of the description of her inner conflict, we can forgive her sins in a way? Uh, what she did can be that an excuse can we forgive what she did and this is the end of the introduction and analysis of more Flanders thank you